My name is Kristen Lennox, and I'm a principal data scientist at Beyond Limits. My job is to help humans and computers interact with each other in industrial contexts. Today we're going to be looking at some Hollywood depictions of artificial intelligence, and I'm going to be giving my view on how similar that is to what's going on in the real world today. 2001, A Space Odyssey. Two astronauts on a mission to Jupiter with a computer in their ship, supposedly the most advanced artificially intelligent computer that's ever been created. Good afternoon, Hal. How's everything going? Good afternoon, Mr. Amer. Everything is going extremely well. So Hal is, is described as working like a human brain, except a human brain that never makes mistakes. Computers really don't work like that. Fundamentally, computers don't think like we think, even when they're displaying what appears to be emotion. I'm afraid they... It's trying to make you more comfortable, but it's not reflecting what's going on under the hood. What artificial intelligence does is more task specific. So we teach a computer to do a task, like drive a car, but we don't have a computer that makes decisions outside of that task. There is one thing that Hal says. The 9000 series has a perfect operational record. Excluding situations where there's a hardware failure. This is actually correct. Computers will do exactly what they've been asked to do. So any decisions that Hal was making that didn't make sense to the pilots. It can only be attributable to human error. During the journey, the computer Hal appears to be making mistakes. This leads the astronauts who attempt to deactivate HAL. I know that you and Frank were planning to disconnect me, and I'm afraid that's something I cannot allow to happen. It's actually very difficult to design artificial intelligence that can potentially be dangerous to humans, mostly because it's very difficult to get machines to recognize when humans are in danger. The film is definitely not an accurate depiction of the state of AI in 2001, but I'd, I'd say this is a solid C. I can't believe I'm having this conversation with my computer. You're not. <laughs> You're having this conversation with me. Her. A world where there are artificially intelligent operating systems. So the main character in the movie gets an OS named Samantha, and they form a relationship. I should tell you that I'm, I'm not in a place to commit to anything right now. Did I say I wanted to commit to you? I'm confused. Samantha is a very human character, so not just mimicking uh, human emotion, but actually experiencing it. I don't know, when we were looking at those people, I fantasized that I was walking next to you and that I had a body. Which makes for a very interesting movie, but is not the way that computers behave today. We don't actually know how to make a computer that wants things. I want to learn everything about everything. I want to eat it all up. I want to discover myself. That's capable of growing beyond what we ask of it. Eventually, the computers reached a point where they were much more interested in each other and much more interested in things that were not relating to the humans who created them, what's called artificial general intelligence, which would be a, a true sort of conscious AI. We don't have a reason to believe it's impossible, but we don't know how to get there. And can we even do it with a, with a current digital architecture? Or would we have to, to switch to something that's closer to what our brains are, which is, you know, an analog biological architecture. But that doesn't mean that we can't get there, it just means that we really don't know when we'd be able to. It's a very interesting film, it's, it's not accurate, and it's a lot of interesting ideas about how things could potentially evolve in the future. I'd, I'd say B minus. Ex Machina. Are you building an AI? I've already built one. A billionaire tech genius who builds a, uh, a humanoid AI robot and recruits a human to, to test it. The real test is to show you that she's a robot and then see if you still feel she has consciousness. So we don't have a clear-cut definition of what consciousness is. The definition that you know, resonates the most with me is to say that consciousness is the experience of being yourself. We don't say that a thermometer knows what the temperature is, because there's no internal experience for a thermometer. There is no reason to believe that our, our current computers have any kind of internal experience. Would we know it if we got it, if we built a very persuasive AI that could interact as if it had an internal life? It's very unrealistic to say that the first 
very human-like AI is going to fit in a human-sized box. Current supercomputers, which are not capable of producing consciousness, fit in buildings and are run by their own power plants. There is some, some hand-waving in the movie about mythical, quasi-biological processing architecture that, that they're going to use to be able to achieve this, but again, it's, it's not based on anything that's real and achievable right now. It's a very enjoyable movie. It's, it's a movie that sort of explores what does it mean to be human much more than it explores what does it mean to be AI. And I would say if you were counting on this movie to teach you about AI, you would not receive above a D minus. Instead of creating an artificial intelligence, he duplicated an existing one. Transcendence. There's an AI researcher who is dying. In order to preserve him, they upload his brain into a computer that he's built. I can't describe it. It's like my mind has been set free. They hook him up to the internet and suddenly he has access to all this information he never had. He starts building things that humans can't even comprehend. We've made a breakthrough with the nanotechnology. We can rebuild any material faster than before. This movie is full of lies. Um, we can't scan a person's brain. If we could, we'd have to take your brain apart, so don't, don't try it on your own. And in a short time, its analytical power will be greater than the collective intelligence of every person born in the history of the world. Even with the best technology, you can't overcome physical limitations. It only has so much storage space. It only has so much processing space. There's only so much power to run it. You don't automatically get this sort of runaway increase in, in capability. I think that there is a, a point to be made about taking the unknowable artificial entity and hooking it up to the internet and letting it do whatever it wants. You need to get me online. I need to access financial markets. But it's unrealistic even in its depiction of the threat there. The way the technology works is, is a solid F. War Games. It's basically about an artificially intelligent computer developed during the Cold War to sort of simulate global thermonuclear war and try to figure out under what scenarios would you maximize survival of, of Americans. A youthful hacker accidentally accesses this computer and asks it to, uh, to play a game, Global Thermonuclear War. In trying to win this game, the computer decides that the optimal strategy is to actually start an immediate preemptive strike against the Soviet Union and launch a bunch of, of missiles. So the first takeaway is don't ever give a computer the ability to launch your nuclear missiles. That's a terrible idea. This computer, which is very, very smart in a very, very inhuman way, is doing exactly what it was programmed to do. And it finds a solution and it goes to execute on it. And it doesn't understand that it doesn't have all the context. That really the best way to win a global thermonuclear war is to not ever start one in the first place. It's showing a computer that's an antagonist, but not a malevolent one. It just doesn't understand. Oh, A plus, A plus, I love war games. When people make movies about computers, they're actually making movies about people. We like watching stories about people or entities that are like us more than we would like watching, you know, this is the life of your toaster. I think as long as people view it as entertainment and say that an artificial intelligence monster is no more real than, than a vampire or a zombie, uh, then it's, it's good, clean fun. It's actually a really exciting time to be working in artificial intelligence, not because we're building robots that have feelings, but because we're seeing a lot of really exciting things in healthcare, in energy. The, the world of research in general has been completely revolutionized. There's so much more good to AI than than bad, and that's sort of the vision of AI that, that I see moving forward.